Ben, thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? Oh, wonderful. It's great to be together. Thank you. Super. Well, we've got a lot of things to talk about, but I want to go back and talk about something that people may not know. But you're a bit handy with a violin, aren't you? Yes, in my distant past. So I started life out as a classical violinist. I grew up at the Yehudi menu in school, which was nestled in the beautiful um, Surrey Hills. And in fact, my father ran the school. He was my headmaster. So I grew up there from the age of eight to eight, eight to 18. And it was a bit of a love-hate relationship where I was talented. I was very good, uh, but it wasn't fully my passion. Uh, I had fantastic experiences. I mean, for instance, we, uh, Lord Menuhin had strong connections with China. And this was when China was still communist and we had the only two Chinese children studying in the West at the school. So we got to go to Beijing and Shanghai many years ago. And I always remember actually on one occasion being in the supermarket and buying a Chairman Mao suit. And there I was all dressed up in green and playing our violins and we got a lot of attention but yeah look i think music what it really unlocked for me was my passion for creativity uh my love of connecting with people in a very meaningful way and it was obviously great to be able to uh, perform which has certainly helped my speaking super i think they've come to get you the men in white coats can you hear the <laughs> <laughs> we can hear that in the background. So, I mean, that's amazing. Do you still play? Well, funny you should ask. I, I do weddings and funerals. So that's, uh, that's if somebody twists my arm, actually it is, I'm, I'm actually getting my violin out. Our head teacher at my, at my son's school is retiring and I've been roped in to get the violin out uh, for a big party. So that'll be fun. Fantastic. That's brilliant. So you and I go back quite a few years and we met when you were working at the Happiness Project. That's right. Maria. Can you share what that is about? Yeah, so the vision for the Happiness Project was, I think, in our work, it was really recognising that probably one of the biggest goals that people have in life is simply to be happy. What you find, though, with that is that the majority of people have not figured out what that means. So the Happiness Project was very much set up really as an exploration in terms of helping people to firstly understand what does genuine happiness mean and then how to be happy. And we put on a range of programs. It was actually born out of a, a program on the National Health Service. And it also then coincided in the 90s with a real focus around what was called positive psychology, which was a a reorientation with psychology away from problems to a far more solution-orientated approach. And then out of happiness, that led to some big themes, uh, you know, such as relationships. So relationship is a key element of happiness. Uh, then also more personal elements like self-acceptance. Um, but I think what it really inspired for me and took me in the direction of purpose and meaning and really helping people understand why they do what they do, what is really of meaning for them. And if you're genuinely living a purposeful life, I would suggest happiness is an outcome of that. Fantastic. And was there a catalyst that drove you to focus on purpose? Was there something that happened in your life? Uh, yeah, look, my own exploration with purpose, there's, there's been two dimensions. So one personal, one professional. On, on the personal side, that was absolutely ignited, really, when I, I left the menu in school and started at the Guildhall School of Music in, at the Barbican in London and very quickly realised this was not for me, but I didn't know what I did want. And that took me off on world travels and many different inquiries and explorations about what do I really love? What am I really passionate about? How do I want to spend my time? What is most meaningful? Professionally, then, it, it, I was very, very fortunate. Uh, one of my mentors introduced me to the CEO of Intercontinental Hotels Group, IHG, about 15 years ago, who were at the time the largest hospitality company in the world. And they'd just changed their strategy. They'd gone asset light. They'd sold off all hotels across the world. And they created a core purpose, great hotels, guests love. And the proposition was in order to be purpose-led as an organization, what does that mean for our senior leaders? 
So with their HR director and some other colleagues, uh, we created a program called Leading with Purpose. 10 years later, we were able to be very fortunate and, and actually develop their top thousand cadre of leaders across the world to be purpose led. That really built my purpose credentials and, and, it's, and it's been my primary focus ever since. And, and do you have your own personal purpose? Yeah, so in terms of the discovery of purpose, uh, I've kind of broken it down to try and simplify the process. However, you know, when you're really getting into the heart of it, it's not straightforward. Step number one is to identify peak moments. So this is when you're at your best, when you're truly fulfilled, when you're in flow, when you are happy. Step number two is to then make meaning of those events. Why are they so significant for you? Why are they so meaningful? Uh, and where are you really getting your energy from? Step three is you need to then take those big themes, put them in the kind of purpose melting pot and ask yourself, so what? So personally for me, if I would give you a quick couple of examples, in terms of me at my best, um, creativity. So that's still a really big theme for me from, from my music days. It now translates for me as writing. So writing is where I have time and space to be creative. Travel. And what travel, travel translates as for me is about learning and curiosity. I have an insatiable appetite, you know, to, to learn and to grow and to be a better version of me. And when I kind of put those together with some other themes, the way that I describe my purpose is to enable truth. And, and truth is what is most meaningful for me. I have always, always asked the big question, why? What's, what's everything about? Why do we do what we do? And that has absolutely driven me in every area of my life uh, in terms of what's most important. Fantastic. So you mentioned your writing. You've written eight books. That's, that's not a mean achievement, is it? That's pretty cool. Yeah, well, I've surprised myself with that. And, and, and to be honest, be, what sits behind that is my love of learning. So, you know, everybody, oh, it'd be great to be a bestseller, but actually the, the truth for me is about my love of learning. Writing gives me the time to consolidate my thinking, uh, to really integrate, you know, what I'm doing and to make meaning of it. So my last book, Purpose, was a distillation because I'm, I'm very experiential in my work. All my work is learning by doing. So give me a really big program a big project a big talk that's when i'm at my best and i have to kind of take that complexity and simplify it and and put that back in a way that people can actually digest it and do something with it so i'm i'm passionate about application you know in all my work in organizations i'm always asking so what great to have ideas great to put that all but i know the reality for people you've got to go out there you've got to make it happen you've got to deliver it you've got to do it at pace in very very complex fast-paced environments so theorizing about stuff it's all very nice but actually it's about what are you going to do with it so writing helps me simplify my thinking so i think i can be more effective in terms of my articulation of what i actually mean Brilliant. And the passion is there. You're so passionate about it. It's lovely to hear. So tell me, can you share some success stories from some of the organizations or the leaders that you've worked with where you've helped them to identify, find and focus on their purpose? I'd love to have some, some um, examples. Yeah. So look, I mean, one that's very, very current is Heathrow Airport. And they were in the news a couple of days ago where they just launched the largest ever public consultation in this country for expansion and for growth. Uh, I've been very fortunate to partner with them over the last eight years. And again, they had to make a very strategic decision to move from being uh, an infrastructure company that built things to service. And they've got 78 million passengers that they look after every year. And they put the passenger at the heart of the business, created a core purpose, making every journey better. And again, alongside with their executive committee, uh, you know, created a program called Leading with Purpose and Values. And what that's done, initially, I, I developed the top 300 in terms of what does that mean? What does that look like? And, and how do they identify their own personal purpose, link that into the organization to make it meaningful and relevant. But actually since then and to this day, I mean, this year, they're actually trickling that down to every security officer 
in the organization. They've also expanded it where they've taken in terms of their engagement uh, with the whole infrastructure around Heathrow because Heathrow employs six and a half thousand people, but Heathrow, what they call Team Heathrow, which is all the airlines and suppliers and uh, is 76,000 people. And very much part of that engagement with Team Heathrow is being purpose-led. And they take that very seriously. They have a charter. Uh, people are measured upon that in terms of their behaviours. And they make some really big decisions for it. One of the biggest ones they made recently was about paying the London living wage. So, you know, there, was it the right thing to do? Absolutely. Was it going to cost the company tens of millions? Yes, it was. Were, they, were there going to be big implications then in terms of shareholder engagement and their whole supply chain? Yes. But the CEO, is, he's very bold. Uh, he's absolutely committed to it. And so he will put down big pledges. Uh, another very contentious pledge that they put down is to be carbon neutral by 2050. So, you know, an airport, carbon neutral, they don't go together. Uh, but again, they've launched a whole strategy on the back of that, which of course expansion is part of. Purpose is being an, it, it's, I can, it's a drumbeat there that is relentless in terms of doing the right thing. I'm writing that down. I like that, that it's a drumbeat. Purpose is the drumbeat. Almost the pulse, isn't it? Like it is. Heart, the it heartbeat. Is the pop. Yeah, absolutely. Because money's not enough. I mean, yeah, and, and to me, enlightened organizations are very clear about this. Yeah, of course you're there to make profit. You know, that is absolutely key to business, but it's not your raison d'etre. It's not your purpose. And I think what I'm noticing now with many, many companies I work with, I mean, again, last week I was in San Francisco with a fantastic company, Gear Deli, chocolate company. They're in San Francisco. They're an iconic brand. I love chocolate. And, you know, and again, they've made a strategic decision to be purpose-led. They want to double the size of the company by 2025. They've got five strategic pillars in order to make that happen. One of them is purpose. You know, and they've created a purpose, makes life a bite better. So it sounds good, but you've got to understand what that means and what that looks like. So a couple of days with the management committee together to really deep dive in terms of what does that mean for our people? What does it mean for our products? What does it mean for our cons consumers? What does it mean for our customers? What does it mean for our community? And they drill down into all these critical stakeholder groups to bring it to life. Lovely. I love that. And I love chocolate, if anybody out there yeah. is listening. Okay, just so you know. Um, can you share some tips, some advice, some strategies for people who want to lead with purpose? Where, where do you start if you haven't established what that is? So number one is you have to start with the discovery of your own purpose. It, it, for me, it's completely inauthentic to go out there. You know, if you're a leader or you're running an organization, we're going to be purpose led and you haven't made the commitment to discover that for yourself. Please don't do it because it will lack any credibility or authenticity. So that starts with yourself. And I think the key requirement for that is curiosity. I'm a slow learner. It literally it took me 20 years to absolutely define my purpose. Now, of course, I accelerate that process for people. But I think, you know, with once you bring that curiosity to the big questions of when are you at your best? What does that mean for you? And then where do you really add value? What do you want to contribute? What difference do you want to make? That will take you on that journey. So that's step number one. Step number two then is how do you then really build purposeful relationships? How do you connect with people on a more meaningful level? And you've got to then be able to have sufficient comfort within yourself, not that you go up and say, hello, Maria, here's my purpose, but that you are absolutely able to build meaningful connections with people that actually do create the conditions upon which I can understand why you do what you do, what does success look like for you? And how can I help you get where you want to get to? And I think, again, relationships then is, number, is, is another key element. I would then be then taking that into teams. So it's all very well. Okay, I've got my sense of purpose and I'm able to build more purposeful relationship. But the only way to succeed today is through teams. So you've got to then be able to build the conditions in a teaming environment in order to really understand actually what is our purpose as a team? Why do we exist? 
yes, we've got targets to achieve, but the way that we're going to do them and how we're going to do that together, being purpose-led, will be much more impactful. Then step number four is to then take that into an organization and to be able, as a consequence of that, to really be, there may already be an existing purpose, so how do you get it joined up? Or you need to be able to reinvent and bring that through and really get people excited about that. And speaking to a leader recently, uh, I, I loved, I asked him, you know, his approach to leadership and he just simplified it in three things. Have a big idea that you get people really excited about, get the right people on board and set them free to deliver. And I think purpose can play a big piece in creating that excitement and inspiration that people need. Wow, that was a masterclass in an answer. That was just fabulous. Thank you for sharing that. Love that. So, so finally, I mean, you've been speaking for a while. If you were able to get into a time machine and go back and talk to yourself as a speaker when you were starting out in the business, mm. what advice would you give yourself? What a great question. Um, I love big questions. So look, I, I think the advice I'd give to myself, well, number there'd be several bits of advice. Number one would be to relax. Uh, I, I remember when I started out, um, I was not your typical corporate clone. I was very left field in terms of many of the audiences that I was engaging with because of my background as a musician and a creative and coming into very, very structured environments um, and I, initially I tried to mold myself to be more like them and actually all that I've learned over the years is no just be more of who I am and obviously purpose has played a key role in that for me and I think as you can tell in our conversation this is very real for me this is not something that I just fabricate or it's uh, you know, idea of, of, of the day. This is, I, I'm immersed in it. I'm passionate about it. I live and I breathe it uh, as a father with my three children. Yes, I have a point of view about how I'd love them to be. But at the end of the day, I know that if they turn around and say, Dad, thank you for helping me discover my truth, my version of that and live that job done. You know, as a coach, as a speaker, in all my engagements, it absolutely focuses me. So I think that to be inspired by purpose, that would enable me to relax, be of myself. And I know the outcome of that is where people would, you know, they'd get something out of that. Very good advice. And I remember you when you started and you were brilliant then all the same. So, and you're brilliant now. And listen, thank you so much for your time. That was very kind of you. Thank you, Maria. Really enjoyable.